For decades, the world's most widely used network troubleshooting tool has been carrying something hidden in plain sight. If there's one network tool that's pretty much used on a daily basis, then it must be the ping. How many times have you been asked to run command prompts and type ping 8.8.8.8 by tech support? And how many times in the back and forth tennis conversation has it been discussed that there's a space between the ping of the numbers and yes, you do need to press enter after the last number? And no, I don't need to know everything that's on screen. Does it say reply or timed out? And what is this ping thing? And why does it exist and who's responsible for it? In this video, we'll learn about who created this magnificently tiny application, what the hidden message is that's inside ping, and how you can make your own customized ping messages, why the ping of death isn't as fatal as it sounds, and ultimately how ping can demonstrate why we can't have the internet as we know it working in space. The ping application was created in 1983 by Mark Moose while he was working at the US Army's Ballistic Research Laboratory. It was inspired by a comment from a fellow colleague called David Mills who suggested that they could use ICMP echo packets to troubleshoot networks. Moose named it Ping because the concept of the application is to send a packet to a host and then receive an echo back from it, which is exactly the same as sonar systems used on submarines. To Moose, the name Ping made perfect sense. Many have said that David Mills, who worked with Moose at the Ballistic Research Lab, gave it the backronym Packet Internet Groper. This was somewhat tongue-in-cheek as it referenced the word grope, which means to feel around in the dark, which kind of describes what Ping does. It is probing blindly into the darkness to see if there's something to respond to. Ping is one component of the Internet Control Message Protocol, ICMP. ICMP messages are typically used for diagnostic or control purposes or generated in response to errors in IP operations. In the ICMP, control messages are identified by a numeric type field. You can see here where Muse named Type 8 Echo Request and Type 0 Echo Reply, referencing the analogy to the sonar on the submarine. Ping features are described in the Request for Comments, known as the RFC. These are the informal notes that were shared among researchers in the late 1960s during the ARPANET project, which helped design the early internet. These informal notes have been consistently updated and are still in use today. The term ping is actually a familiar name for the feature of ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol, and this is defined in RFC 792. Here I examine the general section which states that ICMP is a core part of IP and that every IP host must implement ICMP. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that every host on the internet must reply to a ping. In the section about echo request and echo reply, the RFC doesn't state that a reply is required. It states what the echo reply should look like if one echo request has been sent. The rule is that the data from the echo message must be included in the reply. However, there's no rule stating that a reply must be sent. While ICMP support is required, responding to a ping is up to the host's policy, not the protocol itself. Therefore, if a host on the internet does not reply to a ping, it is still RFC compliant. To see what ping is actually doing on the wire, I'm launching Wireshark on Windows NT4 and start capturing on the local LAN interface. I let that run for about 25 seconds, just long enough to collect a clean sample of traffic while the ping is running. Once the capture is stopped, I apply a simple ICMP filter, stripping away everything else. So we're only looking at the echo requests and replies. Right down at the bottom of the screen inside the packet payload, you can see something that's been hidden all the time, the alphabet itself. Technically it stops at W and restarts again because there are nine bytes left. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I were added at the end to maximize the byte count. What's fascinating about ping is that you can choose a custom payload. The packet doesn't have to contain the alphabet. It is possible to send a customized message in a ping packet, but because a ping will contain bytes, which are raw binary data, you might think you can use simple ASCII character numbers in the ping packet, but ASCII characters could be mistaken for control characters or truncated. What will work is to convert the ASCII character numbers into hex and then send the message as hex. On my Mac, I'm going to send a customized ping packet. Back on Windows NT and Wireshark, packet capture continues until we have 14 ICMP packets. With the ICMP filter enabled again, I can view the payload in the bottom half of Wireshark and copy it to the clipboard. I paste the contents of the clipboard into Notepad, increase the font size, and now on screen, you can see the hidden message that was in the hexadecimal ping packet. If you want to send a customized ping yourself, you're gonna to need to know how to convert ASCII to hex. Here you can see the command I've used to convert hello NT to now on my Mac. Then I run the command in reverse to show the conversion from hex back to ASCII. 
process on Windows is slightly more long-winded, opening command prompt I echo hello nt to now to a text file. Then using the cert util command, I encode that text message into hexadecimal. Then a quick browse using file explorer to the hexadecimal file that we outputted. And now you can see the hex value for hello nt to now on the screen. The ping of death was an early hacker's attack where you can send a ping that is too large or not formatted correctly to another computer in order to cause that computer to crash or malfunction. The example on screen shows a ping being sent that is one byte larger than the maximum packet size. When the number of pings is increased significantly into the tens of thousands, this will cause the victim server to buffer overflow and crash. The crash allows then the injection of malicious code. Because modern virtualization layers sanitize network traffic, it's almost impossible to recreate this behavior directly today. So what you're about to see is a simulation designed to demonstrate the effect rather than act as an attack tutorial. To demonstrate the effect, I will show you what happens to an unpatched version of Windows 95 when a ping of death is sent to it. This command sends a deliberately malformed ICMP sequence, something modern systems now block, but older stacks didn't. As soon as the ping packet reaches Windows 95, you see a blue screen of death immediately occur. I'm deliberately not showing the exact command here. The point is to show the effect rather than highlight the exploit. In order to achieve a simulation of the blue screen of death on Windows 95, I needed to schedule a task to run a specific command that will cause the BSOD. Windows 95 didn't include any native task scheduling, no task scheduler and no at command. I had to install the Microsoft Plus Pack, which did contain System Agent, which would allow me to run a scheduled command. I attempted to schedule the command ccon backslash con, which when entered will blue screen Windows 95. However, upon attempt to click when to run, this immediately triggered it and a blue screen appears. Technically, this is actually a fatal exception rather than a blue screen of death. If you typed c colon backslash con backslash con into Windows 95, the system would crash. This happened because con is a reserved device name, just like PRN or AUX. Attempting to create or open a folder with that name resulted in a fatal error in the file system, which led to the fatal exception. Windows 95 simply could not handle that kind of invalid operation. Attacks like ping of death were possible because of the MTU, which is the maximum size allowed for a network packet. If a packet is larger than this limit, IP breaks it into fragments and puts it back together at the destination. In the mid-1990s, operating systems trusted that these fragments were always correct. When they were not, the process of reassembling them could be overloaded, and sometimes that alone could crash the system. By using the ping command in Windows NT4, I can demonstrate latency, or in simpler words, speed. The speed of a packet across the internet is measured in milliseconds. Here, you can see I'm gonna ping the Google Home firewall that I have in my house. You can see from the ping result that the speed is under 10 milliseconds. So what happens if we ping a device on my internet provider's network? I use the trace root command for this. In Windows, that is called tracer T. I run the command with the dash H switch to show all of the hops along the path. As the ping packet traverses, you'll see all of the IP addresses it touches along the way appear on the screen. The first hop after my own internet connection starts with a 10, which tells me that's going to be internal to my internet service provider. And it's going to be a non-routable address because 10.0.0.0 is reserved for the private address space. When I try to ping that address, it doesn't reply, which makes sense. It's an internal device at my ISP. I ping the next hop on the path. The ping time for this host is 15 to 16 milliseconds. The latency here between 10 milliseconds in my house and 16 milliseconds to my ISP is due to some overhead from the router devices that will be located in the cabinet at the end of my street, as well as the time it takes to travel over the fiber optic cables. Finally, I do a ping to Google's public DNS servers on 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. The reply time is a mixture of 16 or 32 milliseconds. 32 milliseconds is a key threshold. It is much faster than what the human brain and I can consciously notice. If network latency stays at or below this level, you will not notice any delay between pressing a button and seeing a result on screen. In practice, a connection with a ping of about 30 milliseconds or less feels smooth during normal gameplay. If you do notice any lag, it's probably coming from the game, the hardware, the display, but not the network. All of the connection speeds I demonstrated are inside the network itself. However, there's another constraint that cannot be optimized away. Packets of data are bound by distance and by the speeds at which the signals can physically travel. And it's at this point where latency stops being a software problem and becomes a problem with physics. 
Ping can help us demonstrate that if humans were to have a base station on the moon, the internet in its current format would not work. Even if you've got a perfect connection moving at the speed of light, the distance from the Earth to the moon is a little over 380,000 kilometers. The speed of light in a vacuum is approximately 300,000 kilometers per second. Utilizing the formula time equals distance over speed, it's calculable that a ping time to the moon and back from the Earth would be approximately 2.56 seconds. This would be the theoretical maximum as it does not take into consideration any data processing or packet acknowledgement. Even if we were to use an ideal speed of light link from the Earth to the Moon for normal web browsing, the kind of latency that we would be seeing would feel slower than dial-up from 1995. The simple yet beautiful ping command suggests that a new approach to connectivity will be required if humans are to explore space. Ping is a small application that remains important in IT networks, even after more than 40 years. In my experience, I would have spent many hours of stress and hair pulling if it wasn't for this simple command. The standout feature is that if I send a ping and receive a reply, I know the host is up and reachable. The response time gives me a quick indication of network speed and distance. If I get a destination host unreachable message, then I know the issue is likely on the local network. If it says request timed out, then I know the packet left my network, but I didn't get a response back. It's the simplicity of these messages that help me narrow down where to look for the problem. When I first read one of those big, thick, heavy books on TCP IP networking, what fascinated me was the hidden alphabet inside the simple payload of ping, something that's been traveling the world inside packets for decades. I've often wondered how many people realized or even knew that was what was inside it. It was ping that first helped me understand the concepts of routing when I set up two ISDN routers in 1998. It was ping that would help me locate a client computer on the network when we used to dial in with VPN and use real VNC. It was ping that would enable me to find the root cause of packet loss over IPsec VPN tunnels. And so if I were only allowed to carry 10 tools in my technical bag, ping would be there without a shadow of a doubt. Hope you enjoyed the video. The channel's going really well at the moment and I really appreciate all the people in the community that post and comment. Thank you so much to everybody. It's time to move on to the next video and I'll see you on that one. Ta-da!